So welcome everyone, and thank you for attending today's Elder Care Lunch and Learn. Today's presentation is the MIND Diet, Promising Potential to Reduce Dementia Risk. Um, our speaker, Dr. Karen Brayla McNeese, is a registered dietitian with a doctorate in health promotion. Um, she is part of the UK health and wellness team and has been there since 2005. I stalked you, wow, you've got some longevity. <laughs> Um, and I am just so glad that Karen has agreed to share her time and expertise with us today. This is a really important topic. Um, one housekeeping tip, if you could please check the chat box um, for a list of things to remember while in a Zoom presentation. Um, and without further hesitation, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Karen. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Terry, for that lovely introduction. It is great to be here with all of you today. This is a topic that um, we have done a few times here at Elder Care, and it always seems to be very popular. And the more I talk about it, the more I really get excited to share this with people. Um, I hope that you find today's information to be very practical and usable. That is my goal for today. I also want to make sure everybody knows that the um, PowerPoint that you're seeing, you will receive that um, and a couple uh, other materials that are included in the PowerPoint, you will receive that um, as a PDF after um, the presentation today. So Terry uh, and her team will be sending that out. So one thing I want to share before we um, move into um, discussing the My Diet is that it usually goes in the nutrition world, the headlines about the MIND diet outpace the research and the evidence that we actually have, okay? And if you, you know, follow nutrition in the news and you know some basics about nutrition, you know this is often the case. Things get taken out of context in terms of the research, things get overblown, people try to make clickbait and get headlines to get attention um, for, for this kind of thing. So we gotta keep that in mind as we proceed, all right? We wanna be kind of you know, conservative in our approach to that and understanding that you know, the research really on the MIND diet is in its infancy. The MIND diet was really only created officially in 2015. So not that long ago, okay? So that really is, again, very early on when you look at you know, studying um, anything nutrition related from a research perspective, right? Um, has anyone heard of the MIND diet? I mean, is this before you heard about today's presentation, had you heard about the MIND diet in the news or read about it somewhere, heard about it from a friend? Okay, no, okay. Oh, well, that's very interesting to me. It makes me even more glad. Okay, you had, okay. Anne had heard about it. Oh, an article, yes, Terry shared that with me recently in the New York Times. So yes, it is getting some play out there in the popular media. Um, okay, but yeah, it sounds like it's kind of a mixed bag, um, but I'm glad that you are here to learn more about it and to learn about it, like I said, from a kind of conservative standpoint. So we can kind of help you sort the, the, the hype from the reality um, in terms of the my diet. Okay, yeah, and bits and pieces. That's often how we learn about nutrition. Again, when we're following it in the mainstream media or you know, popular publications or social media, absolutely. Okay, so my diet, is an acronym, really. It's kind of clever. It stands for Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. Okay, so that is um, what it stands for. We're going to talk about what Mediterranean and Dash are, and we're also going to talk a little bit about what neuro Neurodegenerative Delay is. Okay. All right, so a little background here heard of the Mediterranean and DASH diets? I'm going to guess most people have heard of the Mediterranean diet. The DASH diet, maybe a little less so. Okay. Okay. So the Mediterranean diet, um, well, actually, we're going to get to that here in, in just a moment. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what the Mediterranean DASH diet looks like. But the Mediterranean diet, um, 
is um, a way of eating. And a DASH diet is a little bit more prescriptive um, in terms of something, it's a diet that helps prevent um, hypertension. It stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So there are two established, well-researched um, types of diets and eating patterns that have been shown to slow cognitive decline. So cognitive decline, right? What is that? As we age, the physical structures of our brain deteriorate. And you know, cumulatively over time, this can give rise to a variety of symptoms associated with aging, such as forgetfulness, decreased ability to maintain focus, decreased problem solving capability. Um, and what we have seen in the research is that the Mediterranean DASH diets do slow this cognitive decline. So what the next step was in the development of the My Diet was these researchers from Rush University, uh, which is in Chicago, Illinois, they looked at Mediterranean DASH diet and said, is there something here? Is there a way we can take elements of the Mediterranean and DASH diets, since we know they slow cognitive decline, and create another diet that might actually help to lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, right? Alzheimer's disease being, again, a, a, a further progression of cognitive decline in a clinical uh, diagnosis as well, okay? So that was the goal. Like, there's something here with these Mediterranean DASH diets. Can we take this to the next level and actually lower risk for Alzheimer's disease, all right? So that's what they set out to do, okay? A um, couple of things I want to say about the research that we have on the MIND diet to date. Folks here, some of you, because you're at UK, you might be involved in research and kind of already understand the differences between different types of research. But the research we have so far on MIND diet shows association, which means this type of dietary pattern is associated with slower cognitive decline, lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. What the research can't show us yet at this point is if that mind diet is causing that slower cognitive decline in preventing or lowering risk of Alzheimer's. There's a very big difference between association or correlation, two things happening together, and being able to prove that one causes the other, okay? So I always like to make that very clear. Uh, this research, again, and this is almost how all, at least nutrition, human nutrition research starts. It starts with association or correlation, and then you move on to causation. Okay. So we do need to have more research that is interventional in nature. Um, a lot of the, the research so far has just been kind of observational. There hasn't been any intervention used. We need um, research where folks can be kind of randomized into different groups and compared. Let's say I wanted to read this comment here. My father has Alzheimer's. He's 93. Would this still help him? He is last stage seven lifetime one to two. Okay. I can't answer that clinically. What I can say is that a lot of the research that we are seeing on MIND diet is showing that even when people have already de developed some level of cognitive decline, okay, or in these very early stages, perhaps of what eventually becomes Alzheimer's, the MIND diet can still be effective. So again, I don't wanna overpromise here, but I certainly would say based on the um, research I've seen so far, it would be worth trying to incorporate uh, whatever aspects of the mind diet might be practical and doable for your father, Victoria. Absolutely. Good. Um, well, what I was just talking about with the research, what's very exciting actually is that the uh, group uh, that's looking at um, the mind diet from Rush University, they received in 2016 um, a $15 million grant, I believe from the National Institutes of Health, to actually do a five year randomized control study following 600 older adults. So like I was just saying, that is what needed to be the next step, and it was. So for since 2016, they have been conducting this research where they're actually randomizing people and controlling the diets um, that they are following uh, for the length of the study. And so from what I can tell, that, that research has wrapped up very recently and I'm hopeful that maybe when I talk about this in another year, we'll have some new uh, data and research from, from that um, to inform us even further about the MIND diet. What's also really interesting about what we know so far about the MIND diet is that 
when they are looking um, at folks and correlating their diet um, with cognitive decline and risk of Alzheimer's, they are controlling for other factors such as genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. They're controlling for age, gender, calorie intake, physical activity, participation in cognitive stimulating activities. So even when you control for all those things, we're still seeing this correlation between the mind diet and a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that is very exciting because that's something people, you know, if you, you know, again, are familiar with how research works, that's the first thing you might ask, well, are they controlling for these things? Yes, they are. So that makes the research even stronger. Is there any research for what is the impact based on race? I am not familiar with that research, Victoria. I'm not, to, I'm not gonna say it's not out there um, in, in some of the earlier research articles. Um, I just can't recall that it was or any details about it. My guess is with these randomized control uh, studies that, that are gonna be coming out, um, you'll probably have some of that information in there. Yeah, good question though, very good question. Oop. All right, so like I said, we're gonna look a little bit more in depth about what what are the Mediterranean DASH diets and then how do they form the MIND diet from those and what specifically does the MIND diet look like? But I just kind of want to get through the, the research background and then we're going to look more at kind of the dietary patterns and talk about how you can really apply that information to your day-to-day -day life. That's, that's what we're here to do, okay? So when they, the initial research on MIND diet, okay, it was observing people. They were observing people over time um, for a period of um, ooh, a few years. Um, they were older adults. Um, and they basically just looked at their dietary patterns over time and monitored um, you know, their cognitive decline and you know, risk for Alzheimer's. They ranked these, um, these participants' uh, diets okay, on, a, on a scale of zero to 15. So you had a max score of 15 which would mean you were fully implementing all the uh, aspects of the MIND diet, okay? So zero being kind of like least adherence and 15 being highest adherence. And then they broke that down into three groups, right? We call them um, tertiles, right? Meaning, you know, there's three groups, low adherence, moderate adherence, and rigorous adherence, okay? Based on how they observe these people eating, okay? So what I find really encouraging about the MIND diet, and I have seen this echoed in other experts' views about the MIND diet, what's really encouraging is that even just moderate adherence, okay, which was actually a score of six and a half to eight and a half points out of a total of 15 points. I mean, we are really talking moderate, right in the middle, doing like 50-50 stuff with the MIND diet, okay? That's moderate adherence you still get a 35% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. That is what I find so encouraging about my diet. And I hope you will too, uh, by the time we're, we're done looking at all of this today. Yeah, Victoria, you like that, good. Um, now again, rigorous adherence does get you, you know, almost, you know, 20 kind of percent difference there. Um, rigorous adherence is still eight and a half to 12 and a half points, meaning, really nobody is achieving the full 15 points is what that means, all right? So most people they looked at, hardly anybody, if anybody was achieving the full 15 points. So, you know, even rigorous adherence, like I said, eight and a half to 12 and a half points out of the full 15 you could get for following all the aspects of the mind diet. So super encouraging, okay? The other thing to take away from the research we have so far is that the longer the mind diet is followed, the better your results will be. So. Um, I think, again, that's echoed in, in, you know, articles about the mind diet and people giving their advice on it. It's just never too late to start, no matter what's happening, start now um, to get the best benefit, uh, for sure. The top third, again, those rigorous folks um, who were adhering, the top third of mind diet followers were equivalent to being cognitively seven and a half years younger than their actual biological age, okay? Um, in emerging research, uh, you know, since this initial research on mind diet shows there might be many other possible benefits and mechanisms by which the mind diet helps our overall health too. Okay, we're seeing um, that the mind diet may lower risk for heart disease, may lower blood pressure, may lower risk for diabetes. Okay, 
Um, and that all makes sense because you may have heard the phrase, you know, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And what's good for your brain is good for your heart. We know a lot of the same things, you know, impact both systems um, and, and chronic diseases that emanate from those. So I think that's really um, important to keep in mind too, that this is not likely just about cognitive decline and preventing Alzheimer's. It's likely, again, I'm saying likely because we don't have all the evidence yet, but there are some strong signs that it points to um, improving your overall health as well and preventing other chronic diseases. One other thing I want to add before I move on to the next slide, I had just kind of come across this in the last couple of days. They, they have done, uh, there was another independent study done with Mind Diet very recently, it just got published this year. What they found is that even when your brain develops those abnormal clumps of protein that are often the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, following the Mind Diet, actually helps preserve cognitive function and prevent signs of clinical dementia. So what they did is they followed folks um, until they died. And then they did post-mortem um, brain scans. And they could see that people who were following the MIND diet and didn't have uh, signs of cognitive decline, often they would look at their brain, see these clumps that should indicate Alzheimer's disease, but they weren't showing those signs. So again, that's really kind of interesting too. And I'm sure more, more research will be done with that as well. Okay. So let's dive a little bit deeper then into what all these different diets are about and what we can take away from those in terms of how to use this um, in our everyday eating. So the Mediterranean diet, again, I think most people have heard of this. It reflects a way of eating that is traditional in countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea, okay? So places like Greece, Southern Italy, Spain. I think, you know, a few of the things that come to mind for people are maybe uh, red wine, <laughs> olive oil, lots of fish, um, vegetables, right? Um, and you would be on track that you can see that's, uh, they don't have the wine on here, um, but they definitely have the olive oil. They have lots of fruits and vegetables. They have a um, emphasis on whole grains and beans, right? Those healthy uh, beans, peas, lentils. Um, also an emphasis on fish um, with, very, with, with very little meats, like red meats and sweets, okay? That's generally what the Mediterranean diet looks like. And I will say again, and I, and I kind of alluded to this in the beginning, the Mediterranean diet is not, is not prescriptive. Um, it's not, there's, it's open to interpretation. There's really kind of no official Mediterranean diet. Cause like I said, it's really just a pattern of eating that generally reflects kind of the, the, the plate that you see here. Okay. The DASH diet, on the other hand, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, that is a little bit more prescriptive. So if you were to do a little bit more research on the DASH diet, you'd see it was pretty prescriptive in terms of how many, you know, whole grains to eat a day, how much dairy, how many fruits and vegetables, um, because that's the way it's been studied to show that certain numbers of servings of these beneficial nutrient dense foods actually can help lower um, hypertension. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, right? I mean, the sugar and, you know, the high fat meats or saturated fats are pretty low, just like the Mediterranean diet. There's still a pretty good emphasis on fish and milk and dairy, whole grains, um, beans, fruits and vegetables. So you can see there's a lot of similarities here and you can see why the authors of the Mind Diet, you know, decided to, you know, look at these two together and see what they could pull um, from each of them to create a new diet. And I think with the research that we're seeing so far on Mind Diet, how they decided to incorporate the, the elements of Mediterranean Dash really seem to have worked, okay? Um, I had a couple, well, let me see. Not sure where I put those, uh, those statistics, but um, I will say that, you know, following the MIND diet has better chance of preventing cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, um, more so than following either one of these diets, okay? Mediterranean or DASH. So what that means is that, I think the, the mind diet research really has honed in on the most, you know, cognitive, um, you know, cognitive benefit 
um, of each of these diets and been able to merge them into a new diet. Any questions about the Mediterranean or DASH diet based on what you're seeing here? I will say, I don't think this probably either of these plates that you're seeing here look that different from what you probably understand to be generally good nutrition. Would that be an accurate assessment? Right, there, there are really no surprises here. <laughs> yeah, um, and so I, I like to emphasize that point that all the things we're talking about, whether it's Mediterranean, DASH, my diet, they are very much in line with the general types of nutrition guidelines you hear about for general you know, population health. Okay, we're, we're, there's, there's nothing really new here. Um, it's just, again, fine tuning it a little bit. Okay. So let's look at how they kind of took these elements of Mediterranean and DASH diet and combine them, okay, into mind. The first thing I will uh, point out to you about the, the mind diet plan is that it is based on the course of a week. This is a little different than how most people are used to thinking about um, a plan, right? You're used to thinking about it maybe like day to day. Um, interestingly, that's what the DASH diet is. It's very much like a day-to-day -day eat these many, you know, servings from these food groups. The my diet, it's a different approach. It's based over the course of a week. So I think that people find that gives, uh, gives the whole thing a little bit more flexibility and feeling of, you know, hey, I can do this. This feels doable, practical to me, okay? Uh, you have one or two days, possibly maybe on the weekends where your eating's not quite as up to par as the rest of the week. That's okay. You can still um, achieve, you know, again, uh, moderate to rigorous adherence with the mind diet, even with that. All right, so let's look at each of these elements here. Um, and then we're gonna look at some food charts that go into even more detail uh, on the next few slides. Whole grains, we're, again, we're gonna look at what exactly what whole grains are here in a minute. Oh, that's interesting, Terry. I'm a little surprised by the percentage of carbs, even though they're whole grain carbs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that's encouraging to people too, because I know we hear a lot still about, you know, keto diets and low carb diets and these still kind of getting pushed um, and still being popular. Um, and, you know, the mind diet is here to remind us like, no, carbs are good, especially if we're using these, yeah, high fiber, whole grain carbs and beans for sure. Um, so whole grains, um, they have a lot of fiber, which we know has health benefits, um, but they also have something called magnesium. And magnesium in particular um, helps blood flow to the brain. And it also helps your brain cells use energy, you know, the energy you intake through food. So that is one of the mechanisms through which whole grains help. Three servings a day, 21 servings a week is what that comes out to. Berries, okay. And I love this because it's getting to be berry season. So it's a great time to take advantage of that. Um, but two, berries a week you guys that's that's what this is um and you guys have probably heard a lot about berries and that there's their fruit that you you know should should emphasize um other fruits also are still nutrient dense and should be included but including a couple servings of berries a week is the mind diet protocol and we know that they have flavanols they have a lot of anti-inflammatory uh, and antioxidant um kind of phytochemicals in them and part of what they do is to help kind of strengthen the connections between the neurons in our brain, okay? So that's how the, the, the compounds and the berries can help us. Beans, all right? So this would be, again, we're gonna look at that with black beans, pinto beans, things like that, white beans. Uh, again, lots of fiber. It's also a low fat plant-based protein source. Uh, and these beans, also have magnesium. So just like the whole grains, right? We talked about the magnesium and the benefits that has on the brain, the beans contribute that as well. Leafy greens, six servings a week, all right? That's not even one a day, you guys, right? Um, most days. We know that our leafy greens, you probably hear about those too, okay? Uh, that color green really does indicate kind of more, um, you know, nutrients, antioxidants, carotenoids, um, phytochemicals. Uh, and these all promote cell growth. Um, they help build uh, the, the brain cell membranes, okay? Um, so that's, that's their importance. Let's see. Victoria, I'm just reading. I wanted to be sure I read your comments here. Carbs give you energy? Oh, yes. 
that is a thing people forget. And I'm going to go on a little tangent here for a moment, but yes, carbohydrates are your body's preferred source of energy. That is how your body is designed. Now, sure, it can find ways to make do without carbs and still, you know, provide you with energy, but it is not your body's preferred way to get energy, right? Um, but yeah, those whole grains, they have more nutrients, they have more fiber. So usually um, they kind of stick with you longer. And of course they have these health properties as well that we're talking about. I eat a lot of frozen mixed berries. My sister tells me it's best to eat mixed berries rather, mixed berries natural rather than frozen. That is an excellent question. The frozen berries should be just as good as the fresh berries. And I will also expand that to include really any frozen fruit or vegetable will often give you just as much, if not sometimes more nutrients than their fresh counterparts. And if you guys don't mind just for a moment, yeah, I'm going to elaborate on why. So if you think about your fresh fruits and vegetables, where do they come from? You know, maybe a lot of you are trying to support your local, you know, farms, you go to the farmer's market, maybe you get a CSA and that would be great. But for a lot of us, if we're shopping at Kroger or Meyer or Walmart, we're, we're, we're picking from produce that has come from, you know, Chile, Mexico, Canada, you know, even maybe just across the country in California. But the point is that when, by the time that produce has reached the store and we're there to buy it, it has been harvested, picked off the plant for quite some time. And as soon as you do that, the nutrients in that fruit or vegetable actually start to degrade, all right? So you could have, say, your tomatoes sitting on a truck for weeks trying to make its way to Kroger for you to buy, and all that time, for example, the vitamin C in that tomato might be degrading. So that by the time you actually eat it, it's a lot less kind of nutrient-dense from that perspective than when it was freshly harvested. The advantage of most of our frozen fruits and vegetables is that they are harvested, right, picked, but then they are flash frozen, which means the nutrients that were in them at harvesting remain in them until you prepare them and eat them. So you preserve kind of all of those nutrients in time when you flash freeze it. And as long as you're kind of not, you know, boiling your vegetables to death or, you know, preparing it in some way like that, you might actually end up with more of those vitamins and minerals in your frozen fruits and vegetables as you would compared to the fresh stuff, okay? Now I know for fresh stuff, again, a lot of times it tastes better, maybe people like the texture better, but I'm a big fan of frozen fruits and vegetables simply for the convenience and also oftentimes the economy of them. Um, and I think for a lot of us, we're, we're watching that grocery budget right now, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's tough and things just cost so much. So frozen is even you know more economical for you as well. Please feel free to, to, to do that. Best of I would say probably, again, I think it, because they have probably been picked so close to when you're gonna buy them and eat them, they have kind of some of the best chances for, for preserving all of those great phytochemicals. Mm -hmm. They're probably gonna taste amazingly better too, yeah. Yeah, no, and they won't go bad, exactly. I mean, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from clients who are like, I'm trying to eat healthier and I load it up on all these fresh fruits and vegetables and then they go bad before I can use them all. And then it just feels like this self-defeating process where you're trying to eat healthier and then you feel bad because you're wasting food and money. But yeah, frozen fruits and vegetables can you know, help prevent a lot of that. All right, so sorry about that tangent, but I hope that that was useful information for you. Um, no, I would not say that, Mary. I mean, I would certainly, you know, kind of balance cost. I would balance, um, you know, kind of your preferences for which things you might prefer to have fresh or frozen. Um, it might come down to, you know, how soon you plan to use a particular vegetable. Maybe that dictates whether you buy it fresh or frozen. So I do think you have to kind of consider all of those things together. But, but yeah, I think if you, you know, buy it at a farmer's market, it's gonna have probably, just as much close to the same nutrition as the frozen vegetables. You'll be supporting your local economy. You'll be, it'll be tasting amazing too. Um, so yeah, I think at that point, it's a fairly level playing field from a nutrient perspective. So poultry, this is turkey and chicken, okay? Um, we wanna actually have that two times a week, all right? Um, there is a B vitamin called choline, 
that is in chicken and turkey. And it's actually something that does um, help fight dementia, okay? Nuts, five times a week, okay? Um, they're rich in vitamin E, which um, is, again, related to lower risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Other vegetables, we're gonna look at what those would include, but we know that you know all of our plant foods really are packed with all kinds of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, even compounds we don't even know exist yet. I mean, that's the really exciting thing about nutrition research is that we're still discovering certain of these compounds and what they are in food and what they do and how they work with other things in our food to maybe create some of these health benefits. So keeping in mind that there's still a lot we don't know. Um, and that's kind of exciting as well. Fatty fish once a week. Uh, I think you guys have probably heard of these, you know, omega-3 fatty acids and their importance. And that's because 60% of your brain is fat. Okay. I don't know if you know that. And about half of that fat in your brain is made from omega-3 fatty acids. Okay. Your body uses those fatty acids to kind of build the brain and the nerve cells, right? So that is why eating these omega-3s are particularly helpful. And then finally, wine. <laughs> sorry, 16% on my brain. 60, 60%, sorry. 60% of your brain is fat. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then wine. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. That might surprise you to see that there. Um, using olive oil for cooking and dressings, okay, where you can. Um, there is actually a very specific polyphenol called oleocanthal. And it helps fight inflammatory enzymes that are present in your body and your brain. Okay. So that is why we you know, the, the olive oil is such a big part of the Mediterranean diet, but it's why it's also recommended in the wine diet. Now, there are a few things that we want to keep to a minimum as part of the My Diet Protocol, all right? Red meat, four times a week or less. And I like this because it's not saying you have to go meatless. I mean, obviously, we're promoting chicken and turkey here, um, but even some red meat throughout the week is okay. Um, I think the biggest danger with the red meat, um, if you were to really you know, try to hone in on this, would be to avoid high fat processed meats, okay? So really trying to minimize things like hot dogs, bacon, brats, you know, pork sausages, things like that, okay? You know, some just like lean beef burgers every so often um, and using again, lean ground beef or just, you know, cuts of regular beef um, that have not been cured or processed in any way. That's a little different ball game nutritionally than those kind of more processed meats. So I would really hone in on, on minimizing those. Fast food, fried food, and cheese. Less than once a week. Okay, this is where I get a little sad about the mind diet, okay? I don't know about you guys, but I love cheese. I eat probably a little bit of cheese almost every day, all right? Um, but again, this is where the beauty of the mind diet comes from is that, look, remember that that moderate and even that rigor is rigorous adherence was not perfect. So again, there's room, there's wiggle room. If you really love your cheese and that's something you want to keep having, there's room for that, especially if you're doing a lot of these other things. I know, right? Oh, yes. This is the one that gets me. I can, I can do the fast food less than once a week, the fried food less than once a week, but <laughs> I cannot do the cheese, you guys, it's not gonna happen. If you feel that way too, I don't blame you. Uh, butter and margarine, fewer than seven tablespoons a week. So again, that's still pretty generous. That's saying, you know, you can have almost a tablespoon a day if you want that, all right? So that's okay. Um, and pastries or sweets, you know, things like your desserts, cakes and pies and ice cream and, you know, candies, uh, less than five times a week. So again, this is not a all or nothing type of eating plan. It is very flexible and very doable. Amy, that's a very interesting point about the cheese, you know, and I have not, yeah, I don't know that I even thought, honestly, to, to, to try to parse that out in the research and see. Um, but you're right, I do wanna point out, nutritionally, there is a difference between more processed cheeses, such as American cheese or Velveeta cheese, okay? Or cheese whiz, I guess, if you really wanna get crazy. Um, there's a difference between those kinds of cheeses and what we call natural cheeses, 
Okay, nacho cheeses being like cheddar, provolone, mozzarella, Colby Jack, all those things, all right? There is a big difference. Those processed cheeses like American cheese have much more sodium and often much more saturated fat than natural cheese. And that's really, you know, when you look at these things to minimize on the mind diet, saturated fat in added sugars are really kind of the two main things that these recommendations are honing in on. Okay. Cause yeah, yeah, you get your saturated fat from those high fat red meats, from your fast foods, fried foods, and cheeses, your butter and your margarine, a lot of your desserts. Okay. So a lot of this is about that saturated fat, but yeah, you can minimize that or at least get less of it. If you're eating a natural cheese versus a processed cheese. Ah, and yes, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So hang tight. Yep. Good observation. Yeah, other than the cheese, you're right. There is no mention so far of the dairy products. Okay, so like I said, I really wanted to be sure we broke down each category because I don't wanna assume that the people here know exactly what whole grains are or what kinds of beans we're talking about, or, you know, I don't wanna make those assumptions and I wanna be sure you have a clear picture of all of the options available to you within each of these mind diet categories, all right? Um, so the whole grains, all right. Anybody here already tried to eat whole grains? Like whole wheat bread, brown rice, quinoa, whole wheat pasta. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, those are some of the examples we're talking about. Okay. Um, and yeah, you're right, Victoria, we can get some calcium from those leafy greens. Absolutely. So even if you're not able to, or don't like to, um, eat a lot of dairy, there is, yes. And also from some of the fatty fish and some beans actually also will give you uh, a little bit of calcium. So yeah, where you can try to choose those whole grains, right? Instead of white bread, choose whole wheat bread, choose the whole wheat pasta, choose the brown rice to the white rice, okay? Um, oats are a whole grain or oatmeal, popcorn, quinoa, buckwheat, bulgur, barley, millet, farro. Those are a little bit more exotic grains. Um, and I've put a star here next to the gluten-free ones because I know there are a lot of folks who, um, you know, maybe you're not allergic to gluten or have celiac disease, but you may feel that you're sensitive to gluten and try to minimize it. I have a lot of clients in that boat. So um, just rest assured, there are whole grains you can eat uh, if, you, if you are trying to minimize or avoid gluten. Check your sliced cheese packages for sandwiches. Many are a cheese product, not real cheese. Okay. Ha, huh, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, sometimes it's not apparent either, right? Like just looking at the product. So yeah, maybe read that that packaging if you're not sure. Interesting. Okay, so moving on to the berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, right? These darkly or you know vibrantly colored berries. That's what we're talking about. Because again, a lot of like I said, color in food indicates nutrients, right? Um, so any of these would work would work well. Beans, like I said, it can be black beans, garbanzo beans, um, which are also chickpeas, uh, kidney beans, navy beans, pinto beans, white beans, soybeans, and also lentils get included in this group. All right. So any of those. I also want to point out, just because since we're talking about the fresh versus, fro fresh versus frozen produce, I want to point out that canned beans are perfectly acceptable here. I'm assuming many of you probably already used canned beans because of their convenience, but please rest assured that yes, you will get um, the, the, the similar nutritional benefits, whether you're preparing them from dry form or using them canned. I usually tell people try to uh, buy a lower sodium version or rinse them off to get rid of some of that extra sodium that's in the, um, the, the canning water. But other than that, yeah, perfectly convenient, cheap uh, form of, of protein and fiber. All right, so these leafy greens, um, I know you know you guys were mentioning spinach and kale there. Uh, yes, those are great sources. But romaine lettuce, poor romaine lettuce, it kind of gets, uh, I don't know, I feel like it gets the shaft um, because we're so focused on these other things like kale and spinach. But a darker romaine lettuce, if that's what you prefer um, or is easier to find, that is perfectly acceptable. Arugula, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, again, these might be a little less, um, well known to you, a little less available, but still count as these dark leafy greens. Yep. Chicken or turkey, like we said, um, preferably we want it to be the white meat. That's generally what's recommended over the dark meat um, because that will mean less 
saturated fat, also without the skin and prepared in a healthy way, right? Preferably without frying. I will say people often ask this, that's why I've added it to the presentation. People ask about pork tenderloin. Where does that fit in? Is that people, and people really never know. Is that like a red meat? Is that a white meat? Um, you see these commercials like pork, the other white meat, what does that mean? I will tell you from a my diet perspective, I cannot find a definitive answer about the pork tenderloin. I have no idea how they classify it, okay? Um, it might include it, but it's not clear to me that it does. Oh, Victoria likes non-salty nuts. Oh man, I'm telling you, I can't do completely unsalted nuts. Uh, if you can, I think that's great. Um, you know, the less sodium, the better generally for, for most people, especially as we age. Um, but the great thing about the nut category here is anything counts pretty much, okay? Uh, and I know people hear things like, oh, walnuts are best or, um, I don't know, almonds, those seem to be the two I feel like I hear the most like promoted, right, um, in, in kind of the popular media. But with the MIND diet, and really I will tell you from what we know nutritionally about nuts, they are all very similar. You're gonna get zinc and magnesium and iron and fiber and healthy fats. I mean, they're, they're, you're splitting hairs at that point, okay? Um, so yeah, whatever's affordable, whatever it is that you like and are you know, willing to eat five times a week, go for it. And you can get lightly salted. I will point that out. I, I like I said, I can't do I can't do unsalted nuts. And if you can't either, I might look for the lightly salted. A lot of them have like an in between version where it's not like the full salted version, but just enough salt to to give it that extra flavor you're looking for. All right. So this is that vegetable category, right? So outside of our leafy greens, um, they talked about eating seven servings of vegetables a week. Um, and what's surprising here, I think you'll see a lot of things you'd expect to see, right? Like tomatoes, broccoli, cucumber, cauliflower, carrots, onions, peppers, green beans. But also look at that. We got potatoes on here. We have corn on here, peas, lima beans, the kind of things people don't often think of as vegetables in the same category as these other ones, right? Those are actually what we call our starchy vegetables. So they do, they do have a little bit higher carb content because they are starchier, the potatoes, the corn, the peas, the lima beans, but they still count as nutrient dense vegetables as part of the mind diet. So I want you to keep that in mind. And I like to point that out because a lot of people say, well, if you don't count potatoes and corn, I don't need any vegetables, <laughs> right? Um, so I want you to know that eh, actually according to the mind diet, you're eating vegetables. So that's fine. Again, hopefully your corn and potatoes are prepared and healthier ways, hopefully you're, you know, roasting potatoes, uh, not making tons of like cream corn and things like that, right? Trying to eat them, you know, with, you know, minimal stuff added, but they count. What about 90% dark chocolate? Yeah, chocolate, the more likely they are to get some benefit. But again, I think kind of like all nutrition research and hype, it, it's been a little bit blown out of proportion, all right? I would say if you already like chocolate, and you enjoy dark chocolate just as much as milk chocolate, then go ahead. You might get a little bit of a benefit and you also will probably get less sugar and less saturated fat from a very dark chocolate, okay? And if you don't like dark chocolate, don't, don't force yourself to eat it either. Just enjoy a little bit of whatever chocolate you, you do enjoy and, and be done with it, okay? Um, fatty fish, I know you guys often hear about salmon and tuna, right? Those are probably the top two. But these other things count too. Sardines. Anybody do sardines? My dad does sardines and he got my 10 year old son to eat sardines. He will just eat them right out of the can. I, I can't do it, uh, but you never know. Or if you've never tried them, maybe give it a try. I was shocked that my son would eat them and ask for them sometimes. Um, herring, anchovies, trout, mackerel, those would all count too. The other thing I want to say in the interest of thinking about, you know, nutrition budgets and grocery costs right now, canned versions of salmon and tuna are, again, totally acceptable, just like the beans, okay? Um, again, trying to find them that are, you know, packed in water without a lot of sodium added, that would be ideal. Um, sometimes in, in households, there's, you know, one person that wants to eat the salmon and the tuna and nobody else wants to eat the fish. So if you find like you're the only one in your house that wants to eat it and you don't want to mess with cooking fresh stuff, uh, yeah, just use, you know, canned um, or those little packs, you know, those little foil packs of tuna and salmon. 
that would probably um, save money and also save on, on preparation time too. All right, so the last thing here with the wine, um, <laughs> I know we often think about red wine um, in terms of health benefits, but it's actually more, um, it, it's, it's red or white wine. They both have uh, particular kind of polyphenols in them that are known to have brain benefits. But here's the catch. If you don't already drink wine, don't start drinking wine just to be in compliance with the mind diet. Okay, that is that is what I'm telling you. I don't want anyone going off saying, oh, the dietitian telling everyone to start drinking wine. That's not what I'm saying. And that is not what most uh, healthcare practitioners would tell you either. Just know if you already do enjoy wine, right? Up to five ounces a day uh, could be having some benefit um, in terms of your, your brain health. Um, but again, please do not start. And also keeping in mind that that five ounces a day is not like, let me not have wine for four days and then drink all of my 20 ounces on the weekend. That is also not what that means, okay? It is really prescriptive. It's the little bit every day that is actually what has the benefit, okay? Just like you would take any medicine. You don't wait and take four of your blood pressure pills at, at one time, uh, you know, to thinking it has the same effect. This is not how it works, okay? So remembering that too, that it's that little bit every day that is probably having the benefit. Anne likes that. Okay, good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. So this is something um, you're going to get a separate PDF of or a bigger version of it um, when Terry sends you these materials. Um, but this is a nice just kind of representation of what the mind diet would look like um, in a week's time. Okay. Um, what I will point out, again, we were talking about the dairy products. Where's the dairy products? The other thing people often ask about is where's the eggs? Nobody's saying anything about eggs, okay? What you'll see on here, let me back up. The mind diet alone as it's laid out, right? With those weekly goals for what to eat, that is not enough food for most people, okay? That is not meant to be all that you're eating. And the mind diet is very clear about that, all right? That is like the framework for your weekly diet, but with the expectation that you're gonna have to fill in things here and there that are not specifically mentioned as part of the mind diet. So that is where things like the eggs come into play, the yogurt, the milk, other types of fruits other than berries, okay? So hopefully that helps kind of clear that up, okay? And you see a lot of the, those things on here. Look, Monday breakfast, you see scrambled eggs, right? Um, you see yogurt on Wednesday at breakfast. There's other fruits mixed in here as well. So just keep that in mind. It's not that that's all you're eating. Um, hopefully you're filling in the gaps with other nutrient dense foods like we just mentioned, okay? But what I love about this, it, it, again, you'll get this, you can study it a little bit more on your own, but it is, it is really simple. I mean, there is nothing complicated on here. It's very whole foods based. You can do it with very simple preparation methods in your kitchen. They are foods many of us already eat and enjoy. Um, they're not hard to find. They're foods you can buy at any store, right? If you already shop at Walmart, I bet you can find all this stuff, okay? You don't have to go to like Whole Foods or someplace like that to find it all. Um, so yes, that's why I say my diet, um, being doable, I think that this meal plan shows that. So kind of want to wrap up here in the next couple slides. Um, the points I really want to emphasize about putting the mind diet into practice is, you know, stuff we've kind of already talked about, but just to review it, you don't have to follow it perfectly to see the results. Remember those scores topped out at 12 and a half points on a 15 point scale right? So nobody, like I said, was doing it perfectly. And even that moderate adherence, doing it 50-50, right? Doing half the stuff week to week gets you that, you know, 35% reduction in cognitive decline and risk for Alzheimer's. So please remember that because, and I think it's so important because people are often very concerned about following a diet perfectly. That is what we hear, right? When we hear the word diet, we think, oh, it's like something I have to do perfectly every day, all the time. That's how most diets are, you know, um, created with that expectation. But this is not that. Um, I almost wish they wouldn't call it mind diet. I mean, I wish it was more like mind 
eating plan or eating pattern or something that was a little broader and sounded more flexible, okay? Because this is not like a very rigorous or you know, prescriptive type of diet um, that you have to follow to see some results or benefit, okay? I think it can be adopted as a very sustainable lifestyle. And I hope you agree after hearing what we you know, talked about today, um, like I said, it's stuff a lot of us already eat and enjoy. It's easily found. It doesn't take crazy amounts of money or you know time to prepare and find these foods. So it is sustainable. And as a dietitian, that's always what's important to me, working with clients. Whatever it is that you're doing, I want it to feel sustainable, something that feels like you could keep doing it indefinitely, right? It does obviously emphasize nutrient-dense foods and whole foods prepared at home. And that's the key at home, right? There is not a whole lot of eating out probably on this because that would make it hard to probably meet a lot of the criteria. But of course we saw there is room for some fast food, fried food, you know, the eating out probably. Um, but I love that it's going to encourage more eating at home, um, especially because of, again, the way grocery prices are now and the prices of eating out are going up even more, I feel like, um, that a lot more people are trying to eat, eat at home just to save money. And so this is kind of, you know, dovetails really nicely with trying to do the Mind Diet. And I also love the Mind Diet, again, as, as a dietitian, speaking as a dietitian, because there's a big emphasis on what to eat. So, so many diets and protocols and plans, you know, they're all about what not to eat, you know? big lists of don't eat this and don't eat that. Uh, there were a few things that we want to minimize, right? We saw that as part of the mind diet, but most of the, the elements of my diet are about what to eat. And I feel like that is a much more, you know, kind of empowering message for people. Um, instead of worrying about what not to eat, once you're focused on what to eat, that's a whole nother ball game that changes things psychologically. So it's not based on restriction. Okay. And then by default for a lot of people, once you're focusing on what to eat, those kind of less healthful foods just kind of get naturally pushed off the plate um, and take less prominence in your diet with you really even having to, you know, really try to do that. So what might my diet look like if you wanted to start taking some baby steps to um, implement some of the elements of the mind diet, these are some thoughts. Like I said about the whole grains, it is super simple nowadays to find pretty much any grain you want to eat in a whole grain version. You can buy whole wheat bagels, you can buy whole wheat English muffins, you can buy whole grain tortillas, you can buy all kinds of whole wheat cereals like Cheerios and Wheaties in total. Um, you buy whole wheat breads of any kind, whole wheat pitas, whole wheat crackers like wheat thins and triscuits, whole wheat spaghetti. I mean, it's, it's simple now. And that's a great thing about kind of consumer demand um, that is people have demanded these products, there's been more of them. And I think for the most part, they don't cost any more either um, than kind of their white uh, counterpart. So that is a super easy, simple swap to start with. Um, maybe using more poultry in place of beef, right? So using that ground turkey or chicken in place of ground beef. Do you guys already do that? Some of you? I'm doing it more, even myself, just because the price of beef is so outrageous now. <laughs> that, I mean, there's just a lot of recipes now. I'm like, forget it. Like, it's not worth it. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I mean, the chicken and turkey cost more than they did, but they're not as much as beef. So even if you're trying to save on your budget, that might be a great thing to do. Maybe getting in the habit of having salads with meals, right? So just make it a habit to have like a leafy green salad before uh, or as part of your lunch or your dinner every day. That will help you hit that, you know, seven leafy greens a week. Snacking on nuts instead of chips. Um, a lot of people, you know, snack on chips because they're crunchy and they're salty. And so to me, I think, well, you know, if that's what you're after, uh, snack on some nuts uh, instead because you're going to get a lot more benefit from that. Maybe using berries as a natural sweetener. I mean, I don't think most people, when you have good berries, you have trouble eating them because they taste pretty good on their own. But you know, a lot of people like to put berries maybe in oatmeal or plain yogurt or on a kind of unsweetened type of cereal um, to give it a little uh, flavor. So that's kind of a, a nice way to work more berries in as well. With the cheese situation, <laughs> the best advice I can offer other than don't worry about the cheese, uh, as long as you're doing a lot of the other things, uh, you might try using sharper cheeses. So like extra sharp cheddar or Parmesan, things like that. 
um, that have a, a more concentrated flavor, which often means you, you don't have to use as much. That's about the best advice I can give you with the cheese. <laughs> um, you might just be able to kind of, yeah, you know, get, get more flavor with less. But other than that, there's really not much of a way I could think around it. I'm addicted to wasabi peas for crunchy snack. Oh, that sounds like a really good option. Definitely better than chips. Yeah. And if they're pea based, hopefully they have some fiber, maybe a little bit of protein as well. Instead of mayo or cheese on sandwiches, which is something we traditionally do. And again, they're going to be sources of those saturated fats. Maybe using hummus spread or avocado on your sandwiches. A lot of times we're just using cheese or mayo to give it a little bit of like fat or, um, you know, kind of wetness on there. So you can achieve that with hummus or avocado instead. Uh, and maybe having a meatless dinner once a week. Um, this is something we promote anyway, uh, especially to just help people kind of learn to enjoy, you know, kind of plant based foods more. Um, but I think again, in with the grocery prices, having a meatless meal once a week probably will help you save on groceries as well if you're using some kind of, you know, bean um, in place of, of a meat for sure. Um, and it kind of just helps you step out of your comfort zone a little and maybe try some new types of dishes that you wouldn't normally if you were including meat. All right, so some resources here. There's a lot of books online about the mind diet more and more uh it seems as this gets more popular these would probably be my top picks for you again you're going to get this um this pdf of the presentation so you'll have this but these are probably my favorite ones dr martha claire morris that first book there she actually was the lead um researcher for that rush university team that developed mind diet sadly she passed away from cancer in 2020 so she will not get to see kind of the full fruition of, of what she started, but she was the kind of pioneer of this whole thing. Um, Maggie Moon, that next one, she's a dietitian, and I believe the other two cookbooks are also by dietitians, which I kind of like, and I trust them to interpret the research um, a little bit better than, than maybe other folks too. That Maggie Moon, who had the cookbook on that other page, she also has a website so if you didn't want to invest in a book or just wanted to get started with something web-based, um, you would go to this. Just Google Mind Diet Meals, you'll see it pop up. There's not a lot of exclusive Mind Diet websites. This is one of the only ones, really the only one I have found. Um, but if you're looking just for like some recipe ideas on how to um, incorporate the principles of the Mind Diet, this would be a great place to go. All right. We covered a lot of territory, you guys. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope it was helpful. And I am happy to answer any questions for anyone that is able to stay for a couple minutes and may have questions. Hi, Erin, you are very welcome. I'm glad you could be here. This is great information, Karen. I, I remember the first time you did this for us and it was that whole thing about the wine. And somebody said, well, can I save them all up until the end? And I was like, well, yeah, can you? But <laughs> um, it's just really well explained. You know, thank you. Thank you. This oh, is great. You are welcome. And thank you again. I, like I said, I'm doing this over the years for you. The My Diet is now very near and dear to my heart. And I believe in it even more and more every time I talk about it. Uh, I will also make a note. You guys might be familiar with US News and World Report. You guys familiar with that website? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they often put out every year, they put out a diet ranking. Oh, I never knew that. US every year. World I don't know for how long, but every year they have put it out where they rank diets, not just for weight loss, but also just, you know, health in general. And the Mind Diet has been ranking in the top five very recently um, out of like 40 different diets. So I also want to, you know, tell you that to, you know, just add to the gravitas of, you know, the mind diet and kind of it's standing right now um, in the health world. It's, it's being taken very seriously. Um, and, and I hope that you guys take it seriously too and incorporate some of the elements. Yeah, this is great. So um, for any, if you've registered for this presentation, I have your email address and I will be sending out the handout that Kieran was talking about. I will be sending out a link to this recorded presentation so you can watch it again or share it with your friends or whatever. Um, if I don't happen to have your email or you didn't happen to register, please just send me, I'll, I'll, in the chat box, I'll put my email. Please just send me your email and I'll get it on that list to send out. 
And that will probably be sometime, maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, just depends on when it gets edited. Well, thanks again, Terry, for having me. Thank you, everybody, for oh, being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining us today. Um, wow. I, I, this is like one of my favorite presentations. <laughs> I love yeah, this stuff. Great. Sounds it like really uh, 